Hi, this is Misha. This is part four in our Finn Rifles video series. And this will be our final one, although we do have episodes on the Finn submachine guns and pistols, so if you're not full of Finn yet, you can check those out. As you can tell by the stuff on the table, we're going to be talking about some of the Finnish military issue self-loading rifles. First off, we've got an SVT-40. This is, of course, Russian-made. Next, we have my Russian AK-47 Type 3 build, which in Finland was known as the RK-54. And finally, and I promise this will be about the last time I drag this one out for a number of months, if not year. We've got my Finnish Valmet M62S, which is an RK62. All right. Well, the first three parts in this series, you looked at bolt-action rifles, which were standard in Finland and, frankly, in most militaries before and during the Second World War. Russia was towards the head of the pack, adopting first the AVS-36, then the SVT-38, then the SVT-40. And since it was standard issue by the time of the Winter War, when Russia invaded Finland in 39, they did go in with a number of SVT-38s. And of these, about 3,000 were captured by the Finnish military. And they did study them. In fact, they sent a few to Seiko, check over, tear apart. And Seiko wasn't terribly impressed. I mean, they recognized the benefits of a self-loading service rifle. And you've got 10 rounds of 762-54R, rapid fire. These guns are relatively lightweight. But they, did, they weren't impressed with either the accuracy or the durability. In fact, they had a list of things they would have done better. And they even put some of these into practice with a prototype that they made one of in November of that year. Now, interestingly, same year, this version, the SVT-40, came out in Russia, and it had a few of the same changes that the Finnish prototype had. Others, of course, it did not. But both nations recognized that this needed some improvement from the 38 to the 40. There was a brief interlude of peace, and then the Winter War, be excuse me, the Continuation be War began in 41, and again, Russia went into Finland, and again, the SVT, now mostly SVT-40, and even the AVT-40, the select fire version, went in with them. And again, Finland ended up capturing another 17,000 to add to the original 3,000. So they had about 20,000 of the SVT Tokarev rifles, considering all variants. And since Finland was in desperate need of a rifle, any rifle, they quickly reissued these, sending them back to the front. Luckily, they did use the same 762-54 rimmed ammo, so that wasn't really an issue, sort of. The Russian ammunition was 148 grain with a steel case. The Finnish ammo was a little more powerful. It was 166 grain with a brass case. So it was a little harder on these guns, which were already not terribly durable, and Finnish soldiers could be pretty pretty rough on their guns. As a result, these were initially liked for obvious reasons, but quickly fell out of favor in the Finnish military because they kept breaking, and Finland didn't have a good source for replacement parts, so they had to cannibalize other rifles, yada yada yada. By the end of the Continuation War, they only had about 6,000 rifles in good working order. 
Now, I mentioned this. Normally, I wouldn't even bring up a small number, but Finland is unique in that they did issue the SVT. There aren't that many users of this pattern. Obviously, Russia, but this was never made outside of Russia, and it was not widely exported because it was already considered obsolete, quickly being replaced by first the SKS, and then, of course, the Kalashnikov, the AK series. So Finland is unique in that it had this. It did keep those 6,000 or so around through the 50s, using them as training. More importantly, it, it, it looked at them a lot. And um, a number of Finnish arms designers would strip these apart and borrow various aspects of it, the ass system, the magazine, the bolt system, whatever, trying to make their own semi-auto and or select fire weapons. So you'll see a lot of Finnish prototypes between 44 and about 54 that are based on the SVT, but these never really went much of anywhere. In the end, they would refurbish some. So people get Finnish captured you know, with the SA in the box, SVT 38s and 40s and think they're completely non-refurbed. This isn't really true. Finland had their own refurb program. It just wasn't like Russia. That's the reason I picked this one out of my safe. Uh, this one is not a Russian refurb, so it has more of the original Finnish. It's not a it's not a Finnish one, but you get the idea. It's closer enough to it. And they would re-blue when necessary. And often they would just re-number parts, you know, E-pin match, force match parts, as they cannibalize some guns to make other ones work. The, the most of the time it was the stocks that got busted, or the barrels were shot out, so on and so forth. But they did refurbish them and keep them around. But they finally gave up. They went in another direction we're about to get to. And they sold them off to Inner Arms in 1958. And these actually became the first SVTs in America. At least ones to be imported. So yeah, that was actually pretty, pretty good timing on the doorbell there, guys. By the 50s, no one was really that interested in the SVT. It was a quickly aging design. Plenty of new designs and methods coming onto the market. And it's not at all surprising that Finland, now it would be the Finnish Defense Forces, the FDF, would start looking again towards Russia and the Kalashnikov. I don't know if they ever really considered the SKS. It doesn't seem like it. I don't blame them. There wasn't really a need. But they were interested in the original Kalashnikov. Well, I should say the, the second version, the milled receiver. The very first, as you know, was stamped. And also, it's 7.62.39 M43 cartridge. Which is a little interesting because of the whole accuracy thing and range and stuff. But there it is. They would acquire some, an undisclosed number, at least I don't know what it was, original AK Type 3s. Much like this gun here. This is a kit build that's been in quite a few vids, but it's a good representative for this one as well. It's a Russian kit on a U.S. receiver, but it's blued. It's got the hardwood like it should have. They would acquire a number of these in the 50s, designating them as the RK-54. They would basically have them for study. They would put some in the front lines to see how soldiers liked them. But mostly, they acquired them for study. They obviously liked what they saw, generally speaking, at least. Because it led to developments and trials, and eventually this gun over here. So, the RK-62. Where did it come from? Well. In the late 50s, beginning around 58, both Seiko and a company called Valmet, which is nothing new. Valmet was simply a new name for VKT, who you remember from the 1920s, 30s, and 40s, making Mosins, would start with the RK-54 and try to make a thin version of an AK. And they basically were trying to make a strong, durable, reliable gun and trying to improve accuracy as much as 
possible while still using 76239. There were several rounds of trials. There were the M60 prototypes, which could have either wood furniture or synthetic. You saw an early version of the tube stock, not quite as thick as this, but there were a few different versions. And some of these were even done in, in field trials. Then there was the upgraded M62, which had improved sights, sight protector, stronger furniture, a little bit stronger receiver, new muzzle device. These would be tested in 1962 and into 63 and then adopted as the RK62. And who won? Well, Valmet, of course. Seiko made a good gun, but Valmet was selected and it was designated for adoption. And it took them a little time to tool up because, again, this is a pretty radically different gun from what they had been manufacturing before. So it wasn't until 1965 that the first RK-62s rolled off the production line, and they looked a lot like this guy here. We have a 16 and a quarter inch barrel, like an AK would, but we have a totally different muzzle device. We have a bayonet lug on the underside, we have a three-prong open-ended flash hider that's actually pinned onto the barrel. This was done for accuracy. We have our front sight on our gas block, which is hooded. Interestingly, there's not a hole in the top, so you can't really adjust it for elevation, but you can adjust it for windage by drifting the screws side to side. So you've got two opposing screws. It's kind of like um, on the late, you know, Finn Mosins. We've got an exposed gas tube. I would assume this is done for cooling and because. Our rear sight is actually pretty different. It's still a sliding leaf, but we've got a peep. And obviously it's mounted on the dust cover, giving a longer sight radius. So these sights are, are definitely better the only trick is you've got to fit this dust cover quite precisely to the receiver, and that's why the dust cover is one of the few serialized parts on these guns. There are not that many at all, but it was serialized to its receiver to ensure it fit properly. We have an AK style safety here. Of course, the original would have three positions, safe, auto, and semi. We have an extended enlarged lever here, a shelf. We also have an extended mag release here and it has a protector the mag itself is basically like a later production 50s mag from russia with the ribbing the biggest change is this addition of a lanyard loop on the base so in case these get dropped in the snow they won't be lost it's just a wire and it's just spot welded on the little clamp sheet metal clamp Otherwise, it's just a 30-round AK mag, and these take standard mags. We have the early pattern of handguard made out of a hard Bakelite-type material with metal heat shield. It's ventilated. We have a similar pistol grip with a metal core. We have this fixed tubular stock. This is an improved version of the original used on the M60. Just made stronger. It has a cheek piece here. We have a cleaning kit and the stock. We fold it open. It's a little, I'm not going to pull it out, but it's a sectional cleaning rod with brushes stored in there so they don't waste the space in the tube at least, which is pretty neat. And of course, we're on a milled receiver. But to try to make it a little lighter, we've added lightning cuts here on the underside in front of the magazine here and on this side. Now this barrel is screwed in. It's not a pinned in barrel. The finish is parkerized and no, the bore is not chrome lined on these. It never was. The internals are very Kalashnikov style as is the trigger group. 
So you see there's quite a few changes, but also there's mechanically a lot of similarities. So not, again, like the M39 rifle in Finland being mechanically like a Mosin, but externally very different looking. So these would be in full production in 1965. Here's that bayonet. It's another Puka style like was used on the Mosin rifles. It's meant to be used as a fighting knife. Here's a three cell mag pouch copied more or less from a lot of com blocks. Holds an oiler here, three mags. In the late 60s, they would do a few updates. They would add night sights. To access the rear, you flip this over. And the night sight is actually adjustable for elevation with a screw, which is pretty neat. They would also have this flip sight. Anyone with the Galil is familiar with this style. This sling would pretty much remain the same. It's kind of borrowed from the Xiaomi and other stuff, but it has several different clips. This is an original, uh, kind of an older style wide clip. They would go to a narrow, and eventually they'd go to a stamped clip. After going to the night sights, they would go to updated front handguard made of a more modern polymer, which would actually enclose the gas tube. And then they would go to a more modern, kind of squared off AK, slightly larger grip. But these would still be RK-62, just little small changes during the production run. They would primarily be manufactured by Valmet. However, Seiko would manufacture small parts and even complete rifles, kind of picking up the slack as needed. So they, both companies would make these. And they would replace older rifles and submachine guns in the FDF. And are still in service today. The RK-62, along with its 7.6239 cartridge, is still standard issue in Finland in 2018. They did consider replacing it a few years ago, but decided just to update these. They call it the RK-62M, which is basically just your, you know, adding some rails, optics, that kind of thing, the typical modernized package. And the RK-62M is a retrofit of older rifles, and it's expected to stay in service until at least 2035, maybe even longer. If it works, it works. These guns are proven very tough. Um, trust me, Finnish conscripts did their best to break them, and um, they could break a lot of the components, but they had a hard time actually breaking like the receivers and stuff, and they tried. So that's why they needed a tough gun. Valmet would not stop with this model. They would do a side folding tube stock version. It would fold to the right, known as the M62FS. Military designation would have been RK62TP. It's The military bought some in the late 60s, but it's really unclear how many, not many. They were kind of meant for bicycle troops and, and, and ski troops and stuff. Then Valmet would try out the M71, which was more of an AKM style. We'll try to throw up a picture. It had a stamped receiver, AKM style sights, a lot of other AKM style features. It could be had with wood furniture, uh, polymer furniture, or even an underfolding stock. The problem was the polymer, whatever mix they were using, was very, very prone to cracking. And I don't even mean like drop it in the cracks. I mean like just leave it sitting and it could crack. It just didn't age well. So you'll see a lot of the polymer replaced by wood. The FDF actually did look at the M71 and even purchased a few thousand. But, and th those were in 76239 by the way. They would also do the M71 and 5.56 NATO, which was starting to become very popular in the 70s. They, they they weren't strong enough for the FDF. That, not surprising. That that stamp receiver and that whole gun's like kind of a it's a nice feeling gun, but it's pretty lightweight because they were trying to get away from both manufacturing costs of the RK62 and the weight of the RK62. So the uh, M71 was only produced until about 1973. Then they would go to the M76, which is a very interesting series because it has so many variations. For one, they would add yet another caliber, 
762 NATO 308 in addition to 556 and the original 762 They would do a reinforced stamped receiver early on. Then later they would even go to a, a simplified milled receiver. It was basically like this, sans the lightning cuts. So it's just kind of a slab side. They would do all kinds of furniture, uh, different wood stocks, uh, fixed polymer. They would do fixed tubes. They would do side folding tubes. Interestingly, the stamped guns would fold to the left and the milled guns would fold to the right. Same basic tube stock, just a little bit different mechanism. The FDF would look at these and they would actually purchase them, designating them as RK62-76. These would have stamped receivers and be in 76239. But from all accounts, they were either only issued to special forces or more likely just stuck in reserve for, you know, rainy day. But they did actually adopt the stamped receiver M76. Kind of interesting. Next up, Valmet would make a light machine gun variant known as the M78, based very heavily on the Soviet RPK. It would be again chambered for all three calibers and again have either a stamped or a milled receiver. It'd have a longer, heavier barrel. That's one thing I wanted to mention about the M76 is you don't see this around a lot. The 76239 and the 5.56 M76s had the 16 in a you know quarter inch barrel, but the M76 and 308 actually had a longer 18 and a half inch barrel, give or take. Kind of interesting. Sorry about. It. The M78 would have kind of the club foot stock. It could either have wood or polymer handguards. It had a folding light bipod, folding charging handle, and it actually used the AKM-ish sights from the M71. Some people think that the FDF used the M78, and they did not. They did look at it, but decided they didn't need it. They were using a myriad of other light machine guns, including a not great kind of takeoff of the RPD belt fed. Uh, it wasn't really an RPD, but that's the best analogy I can give on a creek. Uh, it was called the, uh, yeah, the it was a, a 62 model as well, but it was not a Valmet. Really the final one they would go for would be the M82, which was a bullpup, which was an M76 put into a bullpup stock. It could be either made of wood or polymer seems to have been in 76239 or 556. I don't know if they ever tried a 762 NATO version. Again, the FDF, specifically the Air Force paratroopers, tried out the M82 and absolutely didn't like it. So it never went into service there. That was pretty much the end of it for Valmet. They would start to shut down their firearms division in 85, 86, and then sell it off. By 88, I know they were gone. I think it was even a little earlier, but by 88, Valmet's firearms division was, was closed. So all manufacturing as needed would be at Seiko. At this point, the FDF really wasn't buying more RK-62s, but, you know, repair refurbishment. The final real member in this whole family would be the RK-95TP for side folder. It was developed at Seiko in the early 90s, and it was adopted in 1995. It was basically based on the milled receiver again, 76239 again, and it was an improved version, more modernized. It had a Galil-style right side folding stock, milled receiver, had upgraded sights, it had a new pattern of flash hider and gas block meant for launching rifle grenades. Obviously, it had redesigned modern type handguards, it had an ambidextrous charging handle that was upswept. Kind of like on the, well, I mean, a lot of guns do upswept charging handles now. And it had more modern steel reinforced polymer mags. The early mags were green, but most were black. So, that was the last one. The FDF would buy about 20,000 of those. Then they were made between 95 and 97. And then Seiko II, a decade after Valmet, would close its own firearm division. 
So by 98-99, Seiko lost the production capacity for military guns. They just went strictly to sporting. And that is that. They no longer have the ability to make the RK in Finland from scratch. Very sad. The RK-95s are only issued to special forces and frontline troops, reserving the RK-62 and RK-62M for the rank and file. It seems like about a total of 350,000 Valmets have been built. So, pretty good number. They were in production for a long time. Nearly three decades total. What about semi-autos? Well, since you asked, you asked, right? I didn't just hear that. There's not like voices in my head, right? The first ones to come into the U.S. were this, the M62S. This is actually one of them. There were about 200 brought in with the tube stock by Inner Arms, who had had a long relationship with Finland. And they sold horribly. They were expensive. People weren't into evil black rifles. And even today, a lot of people think the Valmet looks weird. So the next time they imported some, they put wood pistol grips and stocks on them. The forends were pretty much the same. And these sold better. And they imported about 800 to 1,000 of those. The numbers are a little unclear. Towards the end of the production or import run of the M62S, they would even go to the more modern handguards and pistol grip in the late 60s, early 70s. Next, they would try importing a couple of thousand of the M71s exclusively in 5.56 NATO. They never imported 7.6239 versions. I don't know how well they sold, but since the whole M71 production line was kind of a failure in Finland, they sold them off here and then that was it. But the M76 would come in in the late 70s and be the most popular with uh, thousands brought over and they would do a huge range most of them in 223 with a still significant but smaller number in 308 762 NATO but they were marked 223 and 308 for legal reasons and a tiny number in 76239 these would start off with stamped receivers and the 3.9 versions were unpopular because the ammo was hard to get and expensive when found in America at that time. This is before all the Chinese imports, and not China didn't just send over guns, they sent over ammo to us. So we have that. So the, the 2.23, the 308 sold. They did side folders as well as fixed stocks, wood as well as tubular, and even some polymer. They would eventually transition over to milled receivers, especially for the 308 guns. Again, there's a huge variety, so it's very interesting, and no one really knows complete numbers, especially on the larger ones, but it was several thousands. I think once I read it was about eight to 10,000 Valmets in the whole USA, including all versions and variants, so take that as you will. They would do the a semi-auto version, is the M78 as well, M78S to be exact. Again, they would do all three calibers with X39 being the least common. From what I know, and I'm probably wrong, but most, if not all, of the 223 and X39s had the stamped receiver, and it was the 308s that were built on the milled. They could either have polymer or wood handguards, but from what I know, most all had wood buttstocks. And if they had the wood handguards, it would have the heat shield. And finally, they would bring in a few hundred of the M82S Bullpup semi-auto, again, exclusively in 5.56. Five, Never a 76239 or 308. I can't even imagine shooting that gun in 308. It would be painful. It's not comfortable enough in 223. Anywho. Really, the major limiting factor of the 223 and 308s today is the magazines. They both take proprietary and expensive, very expensive in some cases, mags. But at least the X39, now that the ammo is available, takes very common AK mags. There were a few other versions, like the Hunter and some Acurized, like DMR versions of the uh, M78 also brought over. But you get the idea. And obviously, when Valmet 
closed its firearms division. It would send over whatever guns were built here, and they would be sold off through the late 80s. And there was a semi-auto version of the RK95, known as the M92S, made by Seiko. But unfortunately, that pesky 1989 import ban never allow, allowed it to come over. So that's a, that's a real shame, even though they did actually make one that would have been approved earlier. Of course, it doesn't have all the military features, so there is that to kind of talk about. And that is pretty much the history of the Valmet in a, nuts, a nutshell. Finland's first general issue select fire infantry rifle, and still in use, 50 years going today. It's also worth pointing out these are the first AK types to ever be imported for civilian sale into the USA. They were always kind of expensive, but also well regarded. But then the Chinese guns came in in the 80s and were cheap and really brought popularity to the AK. Well, that's about it. We have other videos with this gun. I've got a story time where I talk about this, how I got it here. So if you're interested in my personal story, check that out. We also have one comparing it to a Israeli IMI Galil. There's definitely a connection there. So if that interests you, definitely check that out as well. And if you're only tuning in for this episode, kind of reading the last chapter first, you might check out our older videos on the Finnish Mosins or the Finnish uh, Xiaomi uh, submachine guns or even the Finnish L35 uh, Lottie pistol. Why not? Speaking of these critters, they kept them around. Finland never wastes anything for training aids. Also in the 90s, after the fall of communism, the FDF would purchase about 100,000 MPI M72s from former East Germany, and then another 100,000 Type, uh, Type 56 rifles from uh, Communist China. So they put about 200,000 surplus stamped guns kind of just in reserve for, you know, rainy day situation. I don't think they've ever been really issued. They're just there in case, and I guess they knew, you know, at that time, Valmet was closed, and maybe they knew that Seiko was only going to do that one last run, and then they'd be closed, so it was just, you know, to have, so they seem very still committed to the 7.6239 caliber, in fact, only recently have they talked about retiring it and going to 5.56 NATO, they never really wanted to go to 5.45 Soviet because of uh, many reasons, including uh, Finland's terrain, they didn't feel like it would have good performance in the forests and Arctic of Finland, so that's why they've kept the older caliber. And for now, they're going to keep on using the Valmet. As always, we greatly appreciate you tuning in, and if you could, please like the video, and if you'd really like to help us, please check out our Patreon page. This is Misha, and I'll puka you next time.